Okay, we should be live. Check the microphone. Microphone looks good. Okay. <clears throat> so, it was a rough Memorial Day weekend over here in Saberville. Ooh. Um, between things that I wanted to do and things that I had to do, I did not have <clears throat> time for streaming and was probably not in the best headspace to do it either. Thank you, Chocobo. So, work was particularly brutal. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. H had some people out sick uh, during... The start of the busiest season of the year, so the official kickoff, when we normally get absolutely crushed and we're at lower than normal staff capacity. And on top of that, uh, Opera Omnia, the uh, mobile game from Final Fantasy that I play, uh, dropped one of their most ridiculously brutal events. And I've been trying... I did succeed at the uh, Dare to Defy 3, uh, full clearing the event, but now I cannot kill the stupid Spiritus boss from Shiva's event, <clears throat> even though it's the exact same boss, um, some, I don't know if, I'm genuinely starting to think that the game is glitched, because I cannot figure out why I cannot kill this boss. It's got a whole bunch of mechanics that make it immortal for certain things, and if you're not here for that, you don't care, but it is, it is ridiculous, and I cannot figure out why, <clears throat> to the point where, yes, I'm very genuinely starting to believe that I have found some sort of glitch or bug, and the game mechanics are not behaving properly, because I was able to defeat the same boss, <clears throat> and it is the same boss the way the Dare Defy works, it's just, it restricts what you can use for the fight, and you have to go into the other menu to start the fight with it, so that way you're doing the Dare to Defy version instead of the regular version. <clears throat> and yeah, I am. I was doing it this morning, and I still can't get through it, and I cannot figure out what I'm doing wrong, and I am very angry, actually, like ridiculously angry. <clears throat> but I'm also angry because our freezer in the basement, our big chest freezer that we store all of our stuff in because we don't have a proper freezer anymore like the freezer in our refrigerator hasn't been working properly basically since we got it i hate that refrigerator i wish we had bought a different one but that's neither here nor there about that thing um it stopped working apparently somewhere around last night or whatnot and it won't come back on and so all that food is ruined so <clears throat> That really sucks, especially since stuff that I store in there was on sale this week, and I bought a bunch, and now that's all gone, so. So yeah, I am not having a good day at all. I have not been having a good day since Friday? Let's go with Friday. <clears throat> yeah, Saturday was not, no. I was about to say Saturday was not terrible, but my god, the Dare to Defy fights are so obnoxious. <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> so yeah, so we're back. We're building Tyvar. Enough of my rant. What are we uh, like? Oh, we're only like four and a half minutes in. I even go a full five minute rant, so. <clears throat> but yeah, that's what's been going on with me. I haven't streamed in the past few days because of all of this, so, like, I'm pretty sure the last time I streamed was Friday, maybe Saturday, maybe I did some stuff Saturday before I began this whole thing, but, no, nah, I must have, must have played some Magic Friday, right, or Saturday, anyway, yeah, yesterday and Sunday were a whole thing with my game, and <clears throat> now today, we're down the freezer, so can't get... So I lost all the stuff I got, and we lost all the other food we had stored in there, so... <clears throat> yeah. 
<sighs> We're at 166 cards for Tyvar, and we want to get him down to 60 spells, 40 lands. So 166 is, a, is the spell count if you're randomly joining for Tyvar Part 16 out of like the 10 or so different commander decks we've built. <clears throat> and you want to know the rules for the deck construction. Um, it's not 100% that we're going to need 60 spells and 40 lands, but we're probably going to keep to that, even though we have a ton of mana production in our creatures, because creatures are the easiest thing to kill in Commander. Like, creatures die all of the time, and our mana dorks are not particularly resilient. Like, they, they get swept away by, like, pyroclasms and anger of the gods, in, in addition to Wrath of God and Blasphemous Act and Damnation and getting put back in our hand by Cyclonic Rift so that we have to spend all of our mana again. And if we didn't have... If all of our mana was coming from creatures and we don't have a way to give them haste, <clears throat> that might be an issue. Because we will not be able to tap them. Also, the ones that care about their power suddenly don't tap for as much mana as they used to. Because their power has been depleted. So they have no 1-1 one -one counters. But yeah, that that is what we are working on. And it was slow going last time. I do remember that. Like, everything I would be looking at would be like, eh, that should probably stay in the deck for right now. So... Let's take a moment to refresh my memory. Birds, Tudor, Elves, Ring, Crossroads, or Elves. You have a Withering Boon. That one's up for debate. That one usually makes my list for black spells and then winds up getting cut. And the big reason why it always is on the list is most creatures, especially in Commander, have an effect on the game immediately. Like, Players tend not to play creatures that don't have an immediate impact on the game unless their effect is so good and so essential to the deck. And even then, there's arguments to be made for cutting cards like that if you don't have proper ways to take advantage of them. Like, if it needs to attack, your deck needs to be able to give it haste consistently. Otherwise, you're never going to get your value out of that creature. It's going to come down... Everybody's going to look at it and go, well, that's the original Atali, and murder it immediately. Because they do not want you casting the top spell of all of their decks for free. So, most creatures are going to have good comes into play effects, good statics, or good uh, death triggers. So, Withering Boon gets around all of that by just straight up countering it in a color that normally can't counter spells. So Withering Boon usually makes the list initially for any of my black builds because I want to at least consider that option. I usually wind up cutting it in favor of removal that can kill a creature that where I don't need to have already had it in my hand and the mana available at the time that the creature was being cast. Like, that is the downside to Withering Boon. The upside is that you make sure you don't have to deal with any of its effects. Normally, there are obviously creatures that can't be countered, creatures that can come back from the graveyard, all of that fun stuff. But, you know, if the problem is that your opponent is going to make, like, five creatures by casting, you know, if they cast Deranged Hermit and get their five creatures and trigger their thing in play that cares when a creature comes into play five times, and all of this stuff is happening, and you can stop all of that for two mana and three life kind of worth it. But at the same time, if you draw Withering Boon and you're looking at Elish Norn, Mother of Machines, going, huh, well, all of my creatures still have no comes into play abilities, all of theirs are still doubled, and I have a dead card in my hand, then you're kind of sad about that one. So, that is why Withering Boon gets on the list, and then why it doesn't make it all the way through to the end a lot of the times but I at least like to consider it and see what my other removal package looks like before I discount it entirely. All right, so that was Withering Boon that we were ranting about. Uh, Worldly Tutor, Natural Order, Vamp Tutor. Vitalize can probably go. 
we have other ways to untap our creatures. <clears throat> I did want an effect that would untap our creatures, but that doesn't seem to be... Like, I don't think with... Or Vitalize, rather, Withering Boom. Sorry, I'm still stuck on that card. I don't think Vitalize is where we want to be at. Awakening is very dangerous. <clears throat> I've said this a couple times now. It's very dangerous and very powerful in our deck. So, the trade-off is that opponents that have a lot of reactionary spells are getting their lands back every turn, and players with very large and powerful creatures are gaining vigilance on those creatures, so our little 1-1s one that are mana dorks don't get to attack freely if we don't have anything else to do with the mana, because everybody's creatures are going to be untapped every turn. <clears throat> so, those are the downsides. The upside is that Tyvar is once per turn for his effect, so if we are untapping all of our creatures on everybody's turn, we can then generate mana with them on everybody's turn and get a activation per turn instead of an activation per turn cycle. And when the creatures are getting counters based on their power, because that's what they tap for mana for, like, you know, Kami of Whispered Hope style cards. So if it's on one and we tap it and it makes a mana and now it gets a counter and then we untap it on the next player's turn and tap it, it makes two, goes up to four. You know, we keep doing that and we get back to our turn and it's like an eight or 16 uh, power creature all of a sudden. And so now we're untapping on turn... Yeah, it wouldn't be turn four because Tyvar is a four drop unless we like did some soul ring shenanigans. But you know, if we're untapping on like turn five or six, you know, if we go like turn three, actually, if we ramped and went like turn two, Kami, turn three, Awakening, turn four, Tyvar, or turn three, Tyvar, turn four, Awakening's probably better, and just start tapping this thing for mana, and we're on like turn five. And all of a sudden we have 17, 18, we have like 22 mana or something. That seems really, really good. But then there is the downside to it. So I'm going to leave it on the list because like I said, it's really powerful when it's helping us. It's just, it's also potentially helping other players do other things. <clears throat> that is not great for us, so. I'll have to see, but that that's one of the ones where I want to get down closer to the 60 cards before we just go ahead and cut it. There's Elvish Piper. I have to double check, because right now we have, like, Crater Hoof Behemoth. We might not even have enough uh, big dumb things. We have Crater Hoof Behemoth, we have the Tree Folk, we have Nyx Bloom Ancient would be really good with it, but... Have to see what other things we have. Also, might be all cut uh, for Xeria. Right, we have the two Kamals, who are like a six drop and an eight drop. So, Seaborn Muse, Timberwatch Elves might be able to go, but it works so well with the add mana based on power when it can pump based on the number of elves in play, not just yours. So. The Timber Watch will be an elf. If the creature it's targeting is like Marwyn or I think one of the other ones is an elf. I know there's a oh, the um Gyre Sage. Is also an elf. And so Silvala, if she happens to be the highest power among creatures, well she might be after tapping this thing. So all of those ones getting power boosts from the Timber Watch. It might not be good enough, though, and the Timber Watch is a 3-mana 1-2 that requires a bunch of other elves to be in play. All right, Viridian Joiner is also an elf. Yeah, you know what? We're going to wind up cutting the Timber Watch because we're not going to have more than, like, three or four elves in play, <clears throat> and one of them kind of needs to be the Mana Dork that cares about its own power. And then that's only good for, like, that particular trick. Yeah, I think I would rather have something that just let me pump my creature with some big bonus or, like, a, like, high-power equipment, you know. 
something that when it's attached to the creature, they just have like huge power numbers. So that way I'm getting the extra mana out of them rather than another creature that needs more creatures in play. Like, ideally we want like, I want to say two or three creatures until we're ready to crater hoof. So, because we don't want to just have all of our stuff swept away in a wrath effect like every every turn, and we're not making tokens, so. And most of our creatures are not, <clears throat> um, like, good comes into play abilities. They are activated abilities. We are very heavy on creature activated abilities in this deck, so. We're not going to have a ton of creatures that we just want to run out. Witness, Staff of Domination is one of our win cons. Glimpse to make running out all of those creatures a lot less painful. <clears throat> um, Sachi is staying for right now, but we are very low on shamans. So she has a very high chance of getting cut. I think our shaman count was like 10 or something. We had like almost 20 for Seton, and we had like 10 or so for Sachi, so. Patron of the Orochi. <clears throat> yeah, patron. So the downside of the, to the patron is that um, Tyvar is only once per turn also. So untapping all of our guys gives us a ton of mana, but it does not let us get a second bite at Tyvar's ability. Although the, there are a bunch of things we'd be running if Tyvar was more than once per turn. Um, starting with all of the creatures that remove a plus one, plus one counter to add mana. Every single one of those would be in this deck at that point. Court of Calling, Cloudstone Curio. Cloudstone Curio, with things like Glimpse of Nature or any of the cast a creature draw cards, combined with cheap mana costs or anything, anything else positive going on at that point, just lets us draw a ton of cards, generate huge amounts of mana. Um, if we can give the creatures haste, um, then we have, like... Play a Findorn Elf, tap it for green mana, play a Lalamor Elf, bounce the Findorn Elf, tap the Lalamor Elf for mana, and yeah, we just get to draw our entire deck, find our Staff of Domination, and win that way. So. Kind of want to keep the Cloudstone Curio. We might not need something like Doubling Season. We do care about plus one, plus one counters, but only in so much as we care that our creatures tap for mana because of their power, and Tyvar uses specifically plus one, plus one counters to increase the amount of mana that those creatures can make, so... Things that interact positively with 1-1 one, one counters are good in the deck. We're going to wind up cutting the Magus of the Library, I feel like. Like, either it is... Tapping to draw a card every once in a while in a slow, grindy game where we're looking for action. Or it's not really doing anything in the deck. Like, yes, it's a mana dork, so it can tap for one and get counters with Tyvar. But that's not great. Um, yeah, I can see cutting the Magus of the Library. We'll keep going for right now because we have other things that probably need to go first, but yeah, the Magus is likely to get cut. Uh, the two packs can stay for right now. Slaughter Pact is going to stay or go based on our removal package, uh, but Summoner's Pact is almost definitely staying for right now, because when we get to that part where we need to finish the game, uh, the creature tutors are going to be what we're mostly going to need. Um... There are a few cards that I would like to be able to tutor for that aren't creatures in the deck. Uh, Staff of Domination, Glimpse of Nature, that sort of thing. So we have the Demonic and the Vampiric for that. But most of our things are creatures, including several of our win cons. So Several of our win cons? Definitely Crater Hoof Behemoth. I'm trying to think maybe some of the other ones too. 
Greater Hoof is definitely our best creature win con because we are functionally an elves deck. We have a bunch of the random pieces from Legacy Elves that show up, although we did cut Heritage Druid and ignored Birch Lore because they're not quite good enough in this deck. Uh, Harbinger is a tutor for Elves that also taps for mana. Primal Command is another creature tutor. Thousand Year Elixir, one of the ways we're giving all of our stuff haste. We might wind up cutting the Arch Druid. We have enough Druids that the draw card when you cast a Druid spell is relevant. And there are certainly going to be times where we steal all of our opponent's land. And that's one of the ones where Awakening is terrifying because then we just steal all of everybody's lands every turn. Like, oh, we untap, so on your upkeep, give me all your lands, and then go to the next player's turn, give me all of your lands, and so on. I don't know how often that's going to come up, though. So. Mana Reflection. One of the ways we can get more counters on our things faster by generating more mana, rather than by increasing their power. Also, when they tap for mana based on their power... Tyvar will see all of this extra mana. So Mana Reflection and Nyx Bloom Ancient make the source of the mana produce more mana, as opposed to adding additional mana themselves. Like, a lot of the cards that say, like, you tap this for mana, produces an additional mana. The produces an additional mana comes from the, like, enchant land or something that's generating the effect, not from the uh, source of the mana itself. Uh, mana Reflection and Nyx Bloom Ancient, though, say that the uh, source of the mana produces it. So, if we tap a Laomor Elf for green, Mana Reflection makes the Laomor Elf produce the additional green. It's one event, so Tyvar sees it and puts two counters on it. Uh, Umbral Mantle just lets us go infinite, so that's going to stay... Woodfall Primus is one of my favorite removal spells in green. Bloom Tender is actually questionable because we don't have a ton of black permanents. We are very heavy green, very light black, and a lot of our black is for removal spells, not necessarily uh, permanents. So it's very possible the Bloom Tender almost always produces only green and we wind up cutting her. Uh, visionary combos with the things that are letting us draw lots of extra cards by playing creatures. Maelstrom Pulse's removal. Omnath might be able to go. He does hold our mana, and most of it's going to be green naturally anyway. So... He has a very real chance of just holding all of our extra mana until we're ready to do a cool thing. Because we're going to tap our creatures for mana regardless just to get the extra counters on them with Tyvar. So not having that mana go away when we don't have anything to spend it on at the time. And then, you know, finding our Exsanguinate or um, Torment of Hailfire or just casting Craterhoof Behemoth because we drew them and we have like four elves in play and might as well get all that damage in. Um, Quest for Renewal is a much weaker but much less dangerous awakening since it only works on our creatures and only... Yeah, it's only ours and it's only creatures. So it's less potent... It takes more time to build up, although our deck is designed to get the counters on it very easily. And when it's working, it's doing the thing that we wanted it to do anyway, so. Uh, Tree Speaker, Ulamog, Sanguinate, Azuri as a thing to dump all of our mana into. So we can just win the game, just activate multiple times and overrun... You know, when all of your elves suddenly get plus 12, plus 12, because you tapped one of them <clears throat> for mana. So you lose out on that particular 27 power elf creature, but the rest of them are all plus 3, plus 3, and trample four times over. 
Uh, Necrotic Ooze. Necrotic Ooze is like the weirdest thing in the deck, and I do like him in the deck. Because as soon as one of our elves that cares about its power to determine its mana production dies, um, we suddenly have a base power fourth, or yeah, base power four creature that has that ability. And Azori will see it tapping for mana and be like, yeah, no, that that ooze deserves his counters. Not Azori, uh, Tyvar. Sorry. Azori is right above him and is also a elf lord. So, him Death Mantle as Wrath Insurance. Green Suns is another tutor. Praetor's Council to give us massive card advantage and get back all of our dead things. So we can do it again. Peace Within. Champion of Lambolt is one of the very few um, plus one, plus one counters matters creatures in our deck, as opposed to happening to interact with one, one counters. But she also makes all of our creatures nearly impossible to block when our deck is working. There's Crater Hoof as one of our finishers. I'm very tempted to cut Sumberwald Sage. Like, she's not an elf. She taps for a fixed amount of mana. That mana is restricted to creature spells. And she is a base 0-1. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. We can probably go ahead and cut her. The creatures that tap for fixed amounts of mana and don't do anything else are kind of underwhelming in this deck. And they really, I think, need to be elves at that point or have something else going on for them. And she does not like the... Uh, Shaman of the Ancient Ways, or whatever it is, from Khan's Block, that has a biorhythm effect attached to him. Um, that one seems like a enough of a potent ability. Because if we're about to attack somebody, you know, if our opponents don't have enough blockers where a Crater Hoof Behemoth is suddenly going to make our creatures get through for like 5 or 10 damage against whoever we're attacking if we split it up properly, and all of a sudden everybody's life total becomes that number because they only have, like, three or four creatures in play, then... Yeah, I think... I think Shaman of the Ancient Ways or Forgotten Ways, whatever it is. I keep confusing the descriptors with, like, uh, Priest of Forgotten Gods or something, I'm sure. We'll get to it soon enough. There's our Gyre Sage... Both Nylea can stay for its uh, utility. I do like the Bow of Nylea in my green decks as long as at least two of the activated abilities are super relevant to me. Which, you know, it's going to be really hard for the two damage to flyers to be the thing that's super relevant. It's almost always going to be the 1-1 one -one counters and the cards going back into the deck. Um, but sometimes it's the life gain in the cards going back into the deck, if the deck cares about life gain synergies. But yeah, as long as you've got at least one of those, like, really strong, and then the other one, uh, is a good, solid choice, then putting the bow in and having access to all four options, and the, uh, creatures having death touch, um, just as a backup, in case Tyvar's dead, and we can't recast him and we want to attack with a bunch of Death Touch Trample creatures, because, um... Crater Hoof Behemoth. It's nice to have the backup Death Touch on the Bow of Nylea. <coughs> Are in scales right now for the Counters Matter. There's a very real chance I'm going to wind up cutting, like, all of the hardened Scales effects by the end of this. Because they do increase the number of counters that I'm putting on my guys, and therefore um, increase the amount of mana that they'll tap for on subsequent turns. But they're also taking up slots in the deck. And at some point in time, that's going to be more of a cost than the benefit of getting to add extra counters every time I add counters. I'm starting to think... 
Uh, Shamanic Revelation lets us draw a bunch of cards and possibly gain a bunch of life. Inspiring Call protects all of our creatures with counters on them, which will still be most of our creatures. Oh, and his name is Shaman of Forgotten Ways. But yeah, Inspiring Call is one of my favorite um, tricks in a counters-heavy deck. Uh, just because it saves all of your creatures and lets you draw cards also. So we get to draw a ton of cards. We protect all of our creatures from a wrath effect. And we're good to go. Uh, Shaman, again, the whole opponent's life total becomes equal to the number of creatures they have in play. Let's us kill a lot of players. It won't be out of left field unless... It has haste, and we can produce that much mana and still kill all of the opponents. Which is not as tall in order as it should be. Like, this deck is definitely capable of generating, let's see, it's 14 mana to cast the Shaman and activate it in the same turn. Assuming that we have a haste effect to enable the Shaman. Yeah, that might not be as unreasonable as it sounds at first. Uh, Sorak... Gives our creatures haste, but he might actually be the worst thing that's giving them haste right now. Yeah, I think he actually is. Like, anything else that's giving our creatures haste doesn't care that we have 8 power worth of creatures and doesn't um, need to do it at the beginning of combat. Like, either they have haste from the ongoing effects, or we can give them haste with, like, one of the equipment and move it around, so. I will admit, though, we do have two cards that let the creatures function as though they had haste only for their abilities, so something like our friend Ulamog, who is right down here, or the other Ulamog, wouldn't be able to attack using those effects. I think that's an acceptable trade-off, though, because we need to make space, and I think Sorak is the weakest haste granter that we have. Also a good chance we can cut the Cryptolith right. Originally I put it in here because we do have a bunch of creatures that don't innately tap for mana. But if we give them the ability to tap for mana, then we're giving them the ability to add one plus one plus one counter to themselves per turn cycle, or one counter per turn with an Awakening effect and... Yeah, I think at the end of the day, that's going to be too weak. Like, putting one... Even putting a couple counters on, like... I'm just looking at something like Armorcraft Judge and Duskwatch Recruiter, who are directly below this and don't have mana abilities. And it's like, would I even care, in most cases, that I could do this? And I think the answer is actually no. I don't think I would care that I could do this. Like, it's not worth a card in my deck to have a couple of my other creatures tap for mana randomly. Which, now that we've cut that off the list and it's pulled Rishkar up onto the screen, it's like, he's like, uh, um, um, I do other stuff too. You don't, you don't need to cut me just because that's my primary function, but I kind of feel like we do. That is true. We lose out on Walking Ballista's ability to get more counters more readily, but Walking Ballista is also one of those places to put infinite mana when we start generating it in order to actually win a game. So I think Walking Ballista is safe for right now. But yeah, I can see cutting Rishkar for the same reason I just said to cut uh, Cryptolith right. Uh, Vizier can stay for right now because most of our stuff is creatures. Blackblade is right now the equipment that I have chosen to be the, um, give my creature a huge power and toughness boost. So that way we can generate an extra mana out of the thing. Like, it's seven to equip everyone who's not named Sylvala or, um, Marwyn, but cares about their own power for determining 
how much mana they're going to produce. So that's a bit rough, but... <coughs> it's primarily rough if we get the creature killed in response. Like, seven mana is likely to still make that creature tap for an extra five that turn. From Blackblade. Or possibly more. Like, there's a very real chance in the late game... Paying to equip the Black Blade will actually make the creature make more mana if it resolves, so. That one can stay for right now. We might wind up cutting it just because we don't need it. <clears throat> but it is one of the few ways we have to just dramatically increase the power of the creature so that way it taps for more mana. Marwyn stays because she's one of the things that we're building the deck around. Trophy for removal, Beast Whisper for card draw, Guardian Project also for card draw. Mm. It's four mana, but it's not a creature. Like a lot of our other card draw is either creatures or one shots, like the Revelation or Glimpse of Nature, where once the uh, effect is done, it's done, and then we have to get it back with, like, Eternal Witness or something if we want to do it again. Whereas the Guardian Project just keeps giving us a card literally every time we cast a creature and the creature doesn't die in response to the trigger. Yeah, that is worth noting. The way Guardian Project is worded, if your opponent kills the creature in response, you will not draw a card unless the creature didn't go to the graveyard. Um, because otherwise, when Guardian Project goes to resolve, it will see that you have a creature in the graveyard with the same name as the creature that caused it to trigger, and it doesn't care that that creature is physically the same card. So you would not draw a card off of Guardian Project. That's kind of a weird one to care about, because most of the time, the opponents are not just going to keep killing your creature over and over again to stop you from drawing cards. Um, one of the few ways that that could actually be a major issue is Lethal Vapors. Um, since it destroys every creature as it comes into play, as long as Lethal Vapors is in play. Uh, Guardian Project would be absolutely terrible there, and you might need to skip your turn in order to blow up, um, Lethal Vapors at that point. And then just accept that your next turn isn't gonna happen. And draw all your cards this turn. Incubation Druid can stay right now because she is an elf. She's also a druid, and most importantly of all, once she taps for mana one time, the next time she will tap for uh, three mana because she will get a counter from Tyvar, even if she can't adapt right now, and then that will give her three more counters next time. At that point, she still only taps for three mana every turn, but... We'll leave her in for right now, because again, she's going to tap for a lot more mana early on without having to necessarily pay the adapt cost. But we could get into a position where we just don't have room in the deck for her, because again, she doesn't. She's not super cheap, and she doesn't tap for an exponentially growing amount of mana, so the two factors might combine to work against her. Casualties of War is literally my favorite black-green spell in Commander. I, I don't think... If I know that the Commander is going to include the colors black and green, I have an incredibly hard time not putting Casualties of War. Like, I literally have to be building a deck where I can't run sorceries before I will just go, no, definitely not Casualties of War. <clears throat> And I can't imagine cutting it in any deck where I'm allowed to put it on the list in the first place. Uh, Finale of Devastation is our main backup um, Crater Hoof Behemoth. It does not give Trample, but a bunch of our other effects do, and it's very easy to give an insane amount of damage, like plus 10, plus 10, or more, and Haste is a very real... 
thing that this deck is going to do. Uh, got Eternal Ronus. Right now, gets to stay in the deck, because doubling power on all of our creatures the turn he comes into play, and giving them Vigilance. Like, both of those are a huge boon, because then we can attack with our Mana Dorks, and see if the opponent blocks. And then we can decide if we want to tap them for mana and put more counters on them, or if we want to cast a spell, like an instant mid-combat, and get all the counters on them that way. He might still get cut, but at least what he's doing right now in the deck is really strong. We got Murderous Rider. Great Henge is another card advantage thing that also adds counters to our creature, so it jump starts all of the ones that care about their power by giving them an extra counter to work with. And it taps for mana, and we can reduce the casting cost by having high power. Like, it feels like the Great Henge is just doing everything. Which is unsurprising. I think it's one of the better cards in green commander decks in general. With the exception of green decks that somehow aren't running creatures, like you're using green for ramp primarily, and <clears throat> you don't have a ton of creatures in the deck. Explume Ancient, again, is the mana production. Barrier Breach is our... One of our enchantment removal spells, and maybe we can cut that. Barrier Breach always makes the shortlist because of the ability to exile three enchantments, and it has cycling. Like, it's never a bad card to include. It's certainly a worthwhile option if you're missing some of the other enchantment removal. Um, also, I do have a very strong love of Into the Core, but there are a lot more indestructible artifacts that are problems than there are indestructible enchantments. The main exception being the gods of Theros. <clears throat> All of them being enchantments and being naturally indestructible. Barrier Breach is a way to get them off of the table. So, <clears throat> uh, The Ozolith can stay because we care about counters on a lot of our things. Um, Ashaya is like Cryptolith Rites and uh, Rishkar. Like, that's her purpose in the deck, is to allow all of my creatures to tap for mana if they want to. So yeah, I think if I'm cutting the other two, we get rid of Ashaya here. Uh, Canopy Tactician is an Elf Lord that taps for three mana, so right now he can stay. For the re like again, he's an elf, so that's already a plus for him. So even though he taps for a fixed amount of mana, also he's an elf lord, so he's giving more power to the three elves that I have that care about power. So that's helpful. Again, we might wind up cutting him, but for right now he gets to say um <clears throat> original Tyvar. Gives all of my elves a mana ability, makes elves, puts counters on elves, and the emblem gives my elves haste. So, everything about him is actually working towards the deck, although none of the individual parts are amazing, so there's always a chance we wind up cutting him anyway. Uh, Vorinclex doubles up counters, so he gets to stay until we cut the counters, um, until we start, ca uh, cutting the hardened scales effects. Then we might wind up cutting Vorinclex. Portali Spears removal, Circle of Dreams Druid taps for ever-growing amounts of mana. Again, he's fixed, like, or more accurately, he's fixed as for, like, his power increasing is not helping, but he does tap for like, three to four mana a lot of the time when our deck is working, and that means that he will get three to four counters in addition to ramping our mana. He is another one of the potential cuts because he's a fixed amount, but he's an elf, so he's going to stay in for right now. Uh, Ranger class is card advantage and the ability to put counters on our guys. Uh, Glorious Sunrise gives us card advantage and the ability to give our creatures trample which 
We have multiple cards that give Death Touch, so I also want to have multiple cards that give Trample. So that way we can combine the two more often. <clears throat> uh, Jugan Defends the Temple is definitely one of the cards that will get cut if we start cutting uh, Hardened Scales effects. But if we're not doing that, it is, I think, way too strong because it lets us spend all of the extra mana we have when we cast a creature. Like, just putting a ton of counters on it and making it another must-kill threat every time to the point where somebody has to actually kill the Flip Jugan if they can. Like, if they're not killing Jugan and they don't have a Wrath to deal with the creature that we're putting down, then they're not winning that game. Because if we cast a 1-1 one -one and we get to spend, like, 15 mana putting counters on it, then... Every every single thing we're casting is a dire threat, and I'm not sure how our opponents are living through that when they couldn't deal with Jugan. I'm going to guess it's by blocking. They're just chump blocking every turn. So if that's where we're at, and we're just waiting on a trample effect, I'm pretty okay with that. And otherwise, Jugan's just going to eat a removal spell, but ideally it will have made a monk and put some counters on things and let us do other stuff in the meantime. Uh, Kodama the West Tree is right up there with um, Champion of Lambolt in that it is a creature that cares more about the 1-1 one -one counter synergies. It is giving trample to those creatures, though, which, again, is one of the things that I want to have happen. And in the meantime, it's ramping us in a way that is permanent, like it's actually getting lands from our deck. And it's one of the few cards that lets us land ramp like a normal green deck, so. I'm okay with leaving it in for now. This is another potential cut, especially if I decide the plus one, plus one counters sub-theme of the deck is actually holding the deck back. Like, we need to focus on Tyvar growing the creatures that tap for mana, not ways to make him grow them faster, basically. Uh, Shigeki is our backup um, uh, Praetor's Council, where he can just get back a whole pile of cards from our graveyard. He is limited to non-legendary creatures, but we have Eternal Witness and the Eternalized Eternal Witness on the list, so if he can get back either of them... They can either get back the legendary thing that we need, or get back Shigeki himself. So, uh, Leaf Crown Visionary gets to stay because it has a cast trigger for elves that lets me draw extra cards, and is an elf lord, and a druid. So right now it's got enough synergy with all of the other cards. Uh, Silverback. We definitely have enough cheap creatures where we could theoretically cast Silverback and then cast another creature when we get priority back. Like, we cast Silverback, assuming he resolves. Um, we're the active player, we get priority, we will be able to at least cast one creature and naturalize before anybody can kill him. And if they can't kill him there, we might be able to cast, like, three or four creatures and kill a bunch of artifacts and enchantments in play depending on, you know, what we had in hand and what our mana looks like. And he is a cast trigger, too, so... Not that that should be a factor if he himself made it into play, but... On, on the rare chance that somebody actually has, like, one of those weird counter spells that's super cheap, but it counters, like, the second spell an opponent's cast... <clears throat> Or, like, a Mind Break Trap has happened, because Mind Break Trap only exiles the spells, not the abilities. Um, <clears throat> Awaken the Woods makes a ton of mana dorks, and the biggest uh, hit against it is that they are dryads and not elves, which might get them cut. Uh, Clear Cutter is power-based like, power mana production, 
So now we get back to Gwenna, and every time I come to Gwenna, she's a potential cut. She taps for a fixed amount of mana. That mana is limited on what you can use it on. And we don't have a ton of creatures with 5 plus power. And we just cut another one of them with Sorak going. I have to double check the power, and that's one of the things I keep coming back to. I'm not 100% sure how many high power creatures we have. It's not actually that many, I don't think. <clears throat> like, we have two Ulamogs. Uh, I'm looking at the Silverback Elder, and I'm looking at Sorak and Gorklaw down there. And uh, Crater Hoof and um, Woodfall Primus. Actually, no, Crater Hoof is 5 power, right? And she's... Oh, no, 5 plus power. No, never mind, Crater Hoof's good. Crater Hoof is 5 power, and for some reason I'm thinking that she's 6 all of a sudden. I don't know where I got that from, because <clears throat> I'm looking at the other things, and it is very obvious that, like, Silverback was 5 power, and she's 5 plus power, which is why that works. Um... But yeah, I don't think we have quite enough to untap her and give her her counter consistently. And that's all we're doing is untapping her and giving her a counter, so... Yeah, I think Gwenna can go. That's eight cuts now. Um, <clears throat> this Tyvar lets our creatures tap as though they had haste and can untap them for extra value. Uh, Kami, obviously, is one of the build-around cards for the deck. <clears throat> uh, this Ozolith stays or goes based on Hardened Scales. Uh, Sorak gives Trample. Uh, well, Goreclaw gives Trample. And <clears throat> gives plus one, plus one counters and haste to my other non-token creatures, so... It's another Trample Source and another plus one, plus one counter synergy and another haste source, all wrapped up into one six-mana package. So. Tribute, again, lives or dies based on the, um, Harden Scales, because that, it's going to give counters more often than it's going to draw cards in this deck. So. I don't, I would cut it if it was only in here for the card advantage aspect of it. But letting the uh, creature that taps for mana based on its power, since almost all of them start off at one, the one exception, actually, um, Savala starts at two, and the Cradle Clear Cutter can start at three <clears throat> if you don't prototype it. But yeah, getting all the other ones to start on three rather than start on one. Just gives them that much more to work with. It also works really well if we are um, using Cloudstone Curio and Haste in order to bounce and recast, because a lot of them are going to then tap for the mana that they need in order to cast themselves again. Like, we cast one of the three drops, it comes in as a three power instead of a one power. It now taps for three, so it widens the number of creatures we have available that can generate infinite comes into play triggers that way, if nothing else. <clears throat> Archdruid can potentially go. It's very similar to um, the Dreams Druid and... The Elf Lords, it's like a hybrid between the two because it taps for green based on the number of elves we have. <clears throat> but I think it gets to stay for now. Fauna Shaman is our backup. Um, um, Survival of the Fittest. So that's going to stay in, probably. Uh, Yeva gives our green creatures flash, and we have almost no mono black creatures. And, like, Two artifacts? <clears throat> I'm looking at Soul of New Phyrexia, and as I'm thinking about it, the Cradle Clear Cutter, if we prototype it, we can flash it in, because then it will be green, so... 
So for right now, Yeva gets to stay. Uh, one of our wrath effects that doesn't affect our creatures. Reclamation Sage as an artifact and enchantment removal. <clears throat> the soul might go, but we generate so much mana from our creatures that it's highly likely when we cast the soul, what's going to happen is we are going to just be able to give all of our stuff indestructible by tapping one or two of our creatures anyway. <clears throat> so that kind of offsets the risk of putting so many creatures down. And even if the soul somehow dies, if we get more creatures later, we get a one-shot wrath protection from the graveyard if it doesn't get exiled from there. <clears throat> so that is another way to protect our stuff. Woodland Bellower is, like, the weirdest tutor in this deck. The main thing that's keeping it from getting cut is that almost all of the... Creatures that tap for mana based on their power are three or less, and only two of them are legendary, Silvala and Marwyn. So, <clears throat> it still gets all of the other ones. Although, I don't know if it can actually get uh, Clear Cutter, because we wouldn't be prototyping it at that point, so that's another one we can't get, so... That knocks us down to, like, Kami, uh, Heron Blade. Um, Gyre Sage and Joiner Adept. So, five of them it can tutor for. And we have stuff that can tutor for other things, but it is itself a six-mana, six-power creature, so whether that makes it better or worse... <clears throat> I'm not 100% sure right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Vivian's just versatile. She gets creatures from our deck. Has a naturalize or plummet effect attached to her. I forget what the one that does all three is called. Um, and her emblem gives vigilance, trample, and indestructible, and a power boost. So... Also, she is one of the Planeswalkers. We do have Doubling Season. We do have Vorinclex, so she can ultimate the turn she comes down. And <clears throat> with Tyvar being the source of Death Touch, suddenly having Trample, Vigilance, and Extra Power is probably the end of the game. Uh, Leyline of Abundance has the drawback of it is the source of the extra mana, but it does make all of our creatures that tap for mana tap for an extra green. And you can spend eight mana to put counters on all of your creatures, so it is itself a mana sink if we have infinite mana. <coughs> okay, I think we're good now. Yeah, I've just been talking for like a straight hour now. So my throat is actually going from that, not from the normal <clears throat> ton of phlegm built up, so. <clears throat> yeah, also I took like two days off, so. And also I might have been baby raging at the freaking boss from Opera Omnia. <clears throat> so my throat's a little raw from that also. <clears throat> All right. We have a bunch of cuts. We're coming. We are at the hour mark. Basically, we're at fifty nine minutes. So, I will right, we'll go through the rest of the cards real quick and make sure there aren't anything else that I want to cut from the list. <coughs> but I think that might do it, just because I'm starting to lose my voice a bit, <coughs> and I don't just want to be like trying to clear the throat out for the rest of the stream, like into the next one. So we'll take it easy. We'll just do this one for now. I'll take a bit of a break. I do have time before I have to go into work, so maybe after I give my voice a rest, <clears throat> I'll come back. But no guarantees on that one. <clears throat> All right. Moldervine Reclamation is the our creatures die and we draw a card and gain a life. We can probably cut that. I have enough cards that give us card draw for our creatures 
getting into play or being in play <clears throat> that I don't also need to draw for them dying. Shared summons tutors two creatures, so that gets to stay for right now. <clears throat> uh, Visionary taps for mana and is card draw. Um, it's worse than either one of those things separately, so we kind of need it to matter that it can do both. Otherwise, it's not really pulling its weight here. But we'll have to see where we're at once we get closer to the <clears throat> full cuts for the deck. I can see it going, though, just because either we're going to have other cards that let me draw cards for casting the creature anyway, or we're going to <clears throat> need it to be cheaper in order for it to do the thing that we want it to do. Um, Bramble Sovereign right now... Gives me a way to double up on my creatures coming into play. <clears throat> like, we may, we cast one of the mana dorks that cares about power and isn't legendary, and we pay two mana and we get a second one. <clears throat> and that gives us a ton of extra mana to work with without investing a third card into playing another creature out. Um, Pier is another cares about, um, Hardened Scales effects, and will live or die based on that. <clears throat> Force of Vigor is another Naturalize effect. There's Timeless Witness. Elvish Dreadlord will really need us to figure out exactly how many elves versus non-elves we have. If we are almost exclusively elves and the creatures we have that are not elves <clears throat> tend to grow, <clears throat> then Dreadlord is a fine addition because once it dies the first time and we encore it, if we have three opponents that is minus nine, minus nine to the team, like everything that's not an elf and isn't like an Eldrazi Titan is basically dying at that point. So, it really matters how many actual elves we wind up with versus non-elves. If we have too many non-elves, then we're hurting ourselves too much to cast this thing and flash it back. So, like, the minus three minus three isn't killing a lot of our non-elves because they're already fairly large. There's only a couple of them that start off small, and most of those are the mana dorks that care about their own power to determine their mana production. <clears throat> That's how they made it into the deck in the first place. And all the other ones that are that small that don't do that are already elves, because we've been cutting all the ones that aren't, so... Um, <clears throat> this Kamal is a free overrun once he's in play. He does cost 8 mana to start off with, but just at the beginning of combat on my turn, overrun, just plus 3, plus 3, and haste to the team. Or, I'm sorry, plus 3, plus 3, and trample to the team. And then, <clears throat> for 2 mana, he makes one of my lands a 1-1 one, one haste vigilance indestructible. <clears throat> the fact that he makes the land indestructible until end of turn means that we can spend time animating our lands and tapping them for mana to get counters on them without worrying that our opponents will be able to kill our tiny lands with, like, a recurring one damage effect or something. And we'll be able to get the counters onto our guys. <clears throat> <clears throat> and then possibly animate our lands as part of an all-out attack on a future turn. Uh, Scavenging Ooze is one of our graveyard hate cards, along with the Nazumi. Uh, Bane, just as a mass, um, artifact and enchantment removal, because we have a lot of creatures that we care about, but very few... <clears throat> like, all of our artifacts and enchantments that we super care about are hardened scales type effects, or full-on, like, literally it's doubling season. Like, full-on double the number of counters that we put on things effects. So if we wind up cutting those, Bane of Progress goes way up in value because now we don't even have a bunch of things we care that we're losing. 
And a lot of decks either run very heavy artifacts or very heavy enchantments and rely on them for the synergies that they give to what their commander is all about, so... <clears throat> Bane of Progress is one of those cards, if you can minimize the amount of damage it will do to you, it is absolutely worth running. And the same goes for Wave of Vitriol, that's two cards down. Like, <clears throat> if we're not getting absolutely ruined by that card, most decks do. Like, Wave of Vitriol, I have decks that just fold to that card. Because it's going to kill all of my uh, lands, and I don't have enough basics in the deck naturally to make up for that. <clears throat> um, Freylees. She makes... She literally plus twos to make Lalamore Elves. Um, in all but name. Uh, minus two to naturalize, and her ultimate draws me a bunch of cards. <clears throat> She's a bit weaker than... Uh, Vivian, I feel like. <clears throat> so we would wind up cutting her first, because they fulfill a similar role. Um, Freyleys just makes token elves, so that's helpful. Uh, but her minus can't kill flyers, and her ultimate's a card draw thing, rather than an emblem that will probably help me win the game. <clears throat> Uh, Song of the Dryads is a removal spell that makes Planeswalker or Planeswalkers makes commanders way less impressive because it traps them on the field as lands. <clears throat> and until they can get rid of the enchantment, they'll they're going to have a very hard time getting their commander off of the table and back into the command zone where they can safely recast them. So. <clears throat> Uh, Bloodspore Thrynax lives or dies based on um, Hardened Scales again. And I keep saying that often enough that I'm wondering if we're going to lose the Hardened Scales effects just to make room for everything else, because once those go, that frees up a massive amount of deck space. And I don't think they're 100% essential to what we're doing. Like, I can see leaving in um, Doubling Season and maybe one of the other... Like, the plus one, plus one counters matters doubling season, specifically. <clears throat> and then we wind up cutting all of the lesser hardened scales effects, and just go from there. Uh, Pathbreaker Ibix is one of our backups to Craterhoof Behemoth. We do actually have one, in that once we get a massive power boost on our creatures... This will give us that power boost over again and trample as a full-on overrun effect. So if our strongest creature is like a 12-12, all of our creatures get plus 12, plus 12, and trample. So. <clears throat> we cut Revitalize, or whatever it is, the, like, one-shot. <clears throat> oh, it's just called Vitalize. Uh, we cut that, so Benefactor's Draft. So, it's two mana to untap all of our creatures. It does let us draw a card where the Vitalize is just green, untap our creatures. <clears throat> and it has the added effect of, if an opponent's creature blocks this turn, I draw a card. Every time one of their creatures blocks. So, you, it does untap all creatures, not just our creatures. So that can be a downside, <clears throat> but the upside is that we actually do get to draw a card for casting it, and we might get to draw cards if we time it correctly. <sighs> yeah, you know what? I'm already cutting Vitalize, and I feel like this thing is a slightly better and weirder Vitalize, and I don't think we need Vitalize, so... We will cut the slightly better and weirder version of it also. Uh, Stonehoof Chieftain. It's one of the ways to give our creatures trample, and it also gives indestructible. And he is an attack trigger, whereas the other things are static and need to be in play in order for our creatures to have trample. <coughs> But he's also an 8-drop that's not giving a power and toughness boost. 
<clears throat> he does have the effect, though. He gives Trample, and Tyvar gives Death Touch. So, even... And he's giving Indestructible also, so if we need to chip in for damage, attacking with a Lalmor Elf that's gotten, like, two counters on it is now a 3-3 Death Touch Trample Indestructible. Like, that's going to deal damage to whatever we're attacking, or it's going to kill a whole bunch of things, and I don't care either way. <clears throat> Except in, like, extreme scenarios where the opponent has a bunch of indestructible creatures also, and they're just going to bounce off of each other. Because we do only have to assign one damage to an indestructible creature to trample over it. <clears throat> when we have death touch and trample. And then it turns out that, no, that's not good enough to kill it. I'm 99.9% li I'm .9 sure that's how it works, because <clears throat> no, no amount of damage would technically be lethal to an indestructible creature, but at the same time, any amount of damage from a death touch creature is considered enough to be lethal, so I'm pretty sure that it attempts to assign the one damage, it succeeds, the damage doesn't kill it because the creature is indestructible, so death touch doesn't work, but we still would trample over so, in that scenario, they need three indestructible creatures to negate our one Lalamor Elf coming over to say hi without losing a card somehow in the process. <clears throat> so he can stay for right now, but we'll probably wind up cutting him towards the end when we just don't have room anymore. Uh, Curse of Bounty is our third Awakening variant, or fourth because of Seaborn Muse. This one is closer to Awakening, but it does require the other players that want to use it to attack the player that's enchanted with it. <clears throat> so they're only getting the benefit on either getting the benefit on their turn or casting their spells and untapping their land to hold up mana on subsequent turns. So... Oh, I'm sorry. Untap all their non-lands. So they're untapping their creatures. That's even better than... Because now they're not getting their mana back. They do get to untap their creatures and their artifact mana sources to hold up on other turns. But yeah, they're not getting their lands back. I'm, for some reason, I blanked on the second line saying non-land specifically. I thought it was creatures and lands only. Because I'm thinking of Awakening. Um. So yeah, we're going to leave that in for now. Herald's Horn will be based on the number of elves, or maybe druids, but almost definitely elves at this point. Uh, Blood Tracker made it on the list on the merit that it doesn't have to die for me to draw the cards, it just has to leave play. But I think that's bad enough compared to our other... We have enough other card draw, and we have enough... Um, like, large creatures. We don't need the Blood Tracker for us to pay life to put counters on it to make it huge, although we can do that. It's more that when we use things that add counters to it, we would get free card draw when it died. And I don't think that's, like, super necessary, especially in comparison to everything else we have going on. Uh, Windgrace's Judgment is, like half a step behind Casualties of War as far as if I'm black-green, this card is in consideration. Like, it's spot removal that also lets us kill something from each other player that's a problem. So as long as at least one player has something that is super worth killing with this card, we get incidental value from killing something from the other players. Uh, that can be a little bit rough if the table is super political about it. You know, like, if there's going to be somebody who's going to take great umbrage at having one of their permanents arbitrarily destroyed when it wasn't the problem, but most playgroups I've been in, if you're killing something that they care about going away, they will understand that you have to kill one of theirs also, because that's just how Windgrace's Judgment works. <clears throat> or you might be destroying, like, so many things that matter that it's like, yeah, no. Much like Casualties of War, you're blowing up the most important permanents in play. 
So you're just getting all of that value out of the judgment without risking killing any of your stuff, <clears throat> which can't be said of a lot of mass removal spells, so. <clears throat> um, do I care at all about the Trilobite? <clears throat> it's got the counters. <laughs> Hang on one second. Okay, I have a new project once this is over. But uh, we're almost at the end, so... So yeah, Trilobite. Um, <clears throat> so we can remove counter, add two mana, immediately put two counters back on it, at least. That mana can only be used for abilities, though. So it's its own ability. <sighs> Equip costs... Um, yeah, I don't know that we have enough activated abilities, like, paying mana to put, a, like, one counter on, um, Walking Ballista, or using the mana to activate Staff of Domination when we don't already have infinite mana seems kind of weak. Yeah, I think the Trilobite's just not great. It got on the list because we removed two cat we removed one counter and put two on it with how it works with Tyvar, but that's not good enough, I don't think. Also, the added effect we could remove a counter, put two counters on it, then use the man to activate to put a counter on it, and then we factor in the hardened scales, we can grow it very quickly. But we can grow other things way faster than that. And that's kind of the whole point of the deck. Uh, right hair and blade elite and your ability to tap for mana based on your power. Uh, Staff of Titania is our other equipment that can give a huge power and toughness boost. And it also randomly makes uh, the Dryad Arbor creature tokens. So if we wind up cutting um, Black Blade, which combos very well with this actually because the they are... Dryad Arbors, they are forests and dryads at the same time, so they are additional lands, in addition to being more creatures that tap for mana. Uh, I can see the staff going also, but we'll, we'll wait on that one for a little bit. Uh, the Warhammer deck creatures. Uh, this one is a Harden Scales matters more than a um, mana dork, but it happens to be a mana dork that is a hardened scale effect, kind of. Whenever you cast a creature with it, it comes with an extra counter. So it taps for mana, so it's getting counters, and then creatures you cast start off with an extra counter, and then that's putting a counter on the creature so that all the hardened scales will kick in and add more counters to the creature, so it kind of... Works with the deck. I think this is a very close to a cut, actually. Since it can only uh, add one counter per turn. Like, it's not... It has to be its mana that is giving it the counters, not... Um, something more generic, like... Creatures being cast with mana from... Uh, creatures as opposed to, like, lands and artifacts and whatnot. Basically, if it worked more like the uh, Boreal Outrider, where if we spent mana from a creature to cast the creature spell, it got a counter, this would be way, way better in our deck. So, this one has a chance to go. Um, this one, though, this is probably the one that has the best chance of staying. So, making all of our plus one, plus one counters count twice effectively, giving all of our creatures an additional plus one, plus one for every one, one counter they already have, allows for much more exponential growth from our mana dorks that tap based on power with Tyvar. No, it's like, okay, so this is a one, one with five counters on it, so it's a six, six, except now it's a 
11 11 so now it taps for 11 mana gets 11 more counters which gives it an extra plus 22 plus 22 while this guy yeah it just gets way out of hand way too quickly so it's basically another doubling season type effect at that point so i want to at least consider it um the tyrant guard is one of the ones that can easily go though because it has to be in play and you have to sacrifice it so more than likely somebody is going to try and kill it first um it does require spot removal before they can kill any of your other things and also the it only protects the ones with counters on them and we already have that effect where we can ambush them with the uh card from cons of tarkir or dragons of tarkir i'm blanking on the name of it but the one that i really like where you draw cards for each creature you have with counters on them and they gain indestructible until end of turn so yeah he's probably just too much of a worse version of that we also have the heroic intervention to ambush with so all right we're up to 13 cuts now uh, Allosaurus Rider can stay for now because we have so many elves, so making them suddenly base 5-5s five is useful, but we might wind up cutting it. Branching Evolution is our hardened scales, but doubling season one, so uh, Hydra's another uh hardened scales and earthshaker giant is an overrun so we have 13 cards right if i cut just the number two or copy it over there yeah so we have 13 cards so we're down to 153 and we are at oh wow we made it to an hour and 22 minutes i did not think it was going to take that long all right so we're going to save here like I said, I suddenly have another project that needs my attention, so I was going to stop anyway, but thank you for watching, and I will see you next time. Have a good rest of your day.